Okay, welcome back. So we've already got all the, the terminology and the tools in place here to now actually find some probabilities of compound events. Okay, so, so where that starts right, is back at our axioms of probability. Right, It's number one, that everything in our sample space has to add up to one. Number two, the probability of any event has to be between zero and one. And now we're going to make some more sense of our third axiom of probability. All right, that's our disjoint addition rule. So we'll see that here in a minute. But just remember one, one kind of basic, more basic rule of probability was our complement rule. All right, and that follows from the first and second axiom of probability. So we've, we've seen that before in a previous video. All right, so the two types of compound events that we might look for, which we've defined before, are number one, our union. So remember the key word with the union is or, right? And our little symbol, it's easy to remember, it's that U. Okay, the other type of compound event we might look for is our intersection, right? Our key word there is and, okay, and the symbol is that upside down U. Okay, so we're gonna start with unions because I think, I think unions, are a little bit easier to understand. So in order to do that, let's look back at the idea of two mutually exclusive events. Right now we know what this means. We also know that another word for mutually exclusive, kind of a shortened way of saying that, is disjoint. Right? The the probability definition of that is these are two events that have no common outcomes. Two things that can't occur at the same time. Okay, so consider a Venn diagram of two mutually exclusive events. Okay, so not very exciting, not a lot going on right there, but we do notice they have no overlap. In other words, they have no intersection. All right, so that's the first part of our third axiom of probability. Right? They have no common outcomes, they have no intersection. All right, so to find their union, all we have to do is add up everything in A plus everything in B. All right? That is our third axiom of probability. That's our disjoint addition rule. So that's the, probably the simplest probability rule, maybe even easier than our complement rule. So the union of two mutually exclusive events, just add them together. All right? What if these events are not mutually exclusive? Well, it gets a little bit more complicated because consider their Venn diagram. Right? If they're not mutually exclusive, then they are going to have an intersection. They are going to have an overlap, and that's visualized in this diagram by this orange kind of football-shaped area. All right, well, what if we try to do what we did before? What if we try to just say, okay, let's take A plus B? Well, that almost worked, but maybe you're seeing a little problem there. Okay, the problem is this intersection, right? If I have outcomes in this intersection, and I count everything in yellow, and then I count everything in pink, right? that means everything in this intersection has been counted twice. All right, So we could end up with a probability greater than one. We're over counting. So what we have to do if we have an intersection, we take A, we take B, but then we have to subtract off that intersection. Similar idea here to what we did before, except we have to subtract off the intersection to eliminate our double counting issue. All right? So don't forget that intersection if they're not mutually exclusive. So let's sum all that up. So our addition rule is looks like this. Now we know if they are disjoint, that is essentially zero. Right? So it's like subtracting zero if you think about it. That's, that's basically what our disjoint addition rule says. A plus B minus zero. Okay, so, so unions are easy enough. We just got to remember, are they mutually exclusive or not? So what about intersections? Well, we already know one thing when it comes to finding an intersection. right? If A and B are disjoint, okay, it doesn't exist. It's zero. So if, they're, if we're finding a mutually exclusive intersection, that's easy. It's zero. And I guess another way we could do it is we could take that addition rule that we just saw and we could rewrite it. Right? If I was given the union and I was given these two pieces, I could solve for this. That, that's one way to do it. Uh, but oftentimes, we, we don't have the union. Right? We may just have information about A and B and we want to find the intersection. So what do we do there? 
We usually define an intersection, that's where our multiplication rule comes in. Okay, so we use the addition rule for unions, we use multiplication for intersections. So what does that look like? Well, our intersection of A and B, if they're not mutually exclusive, we take B given A times A, or we can also flip it around and say A given B times B. Both of these will get us where we need to go. Notice whatever we're given shows up in our next multiplier. All right, so both of those, it, in, in some problems, it kind of just depends on what makes more sense or what's easier to get, from what I call A, what I call B, all right, but, but these are equivalent. Now we also see that we've got some conditional probabilities involved here. Okay, so how do we find conditional probabilities? Well, we know the definition of conditional probabilities. So again, one way to find a conditional probability using a rule that we already have, rewrite our multiplication rule. Right? B given A is equal to the intersection of A and B over whatever I'm given goes in my denominator. But again, what if we're trying to find the intersection right? and, and I don't know this? Okay. So what do we do? Well, lots of times in that case, we kind of just have to think about the situation and come up with a conditional probability on our own. Okay, so we'll see an example of that in the future. So we've talked about how being mutually exclusive affects each of these things. What about independence? Well, independence doesn't have much of an effect on finding unions, right? But it does have an effect on conditional probabilities. Right? If I have two events, A and B, that I know are independent, well, what does that mean? It means they don't affect each other. But what is conditional probability all about? Conditional probability is saying, okay, I know one event has already happened. How does that affect the other one? Well, if they're independent, they have no effect. So if I say something like the probability of A given B, but A and B are independent, it's simply probability of A. Likewise, B given A, if A and B are independent, it's just probability of B. All right, let's think about that with an example. So we have three events here, probability of oversleeping, probability you eat breakfast, probability you have green eyes. All right, you probably see some relationships here. All right, so consider the probability given you oversleep, the probability you eat breakfast. So don't you think if you oversleep, maybe you're less likely to eat breakfast? I think there is some sort of relationship here. They're probably not independent. So a conditional probability like this would be interesting. We could find that. On the other hand, what if I said, well, what's the probability you eat breakfast given your eyes are green? All right, those have no effect on each other. Those are completely independent. So probability of eating breakfast given green eyes is just probability of B. What does that tell us about our multiplication rule if things are independent? We know that A given B is just equal to A. So if I take that multiplication rule, I know A given B which is equal to A, so substitute that in. So, so the intersection of A and B if they are independent is simply A times B. So let's summarize some things. All right, so remember a lot of what we've been talking about, we've been, we've been talking about rules for intersections, right? My multiplication rule, we've been talking about rules for defining unions, that's our addition rule. And we apply them differently based on these relationship terms, right? So there's really, if we have two events, there's really four situations we find ourselves in, right? Four different combinations here. Now I have this in red because that's kind of our default starting point. Whenever I go into a problem, I have to assume they're dependent and they're not mutually exclusive, right? But if I'm given some information that lets me kind of move around on this grid, right, what we saw was things were generally easier if, if stuff was independent or if events were mutually exclusive, okay? But I need to know how to move around this grid and apply those rules in all of these different situations, right? So if we think about it, Right, there's, there's four spots on this grid. There's two rules, basically, multiplication and addition. So there's, so there's really eight different kinds of problems that 
we need to make sure we're we're good with at least when it comes to two events right now what if I want to what if we want to generalize this to multiple events all right because we know we know now what to do with just two events in all these different situations right but what if we want something like this probability of a or b or c well as long as they're still mutually exclusive or disjoint right we still should be able to apply that addition rule just say a plus b plus c right easy enough right what if i wanted to keep extending that to n events as many events as i want well i can keep doing that as long as i know they are mutually exclusive and here's where it gets trickier what if they are not disjoint not mutually exclusive and I wanted to know something like A or B or C. All right, we'll consider a three wave Venn diagram. Okay, so there's a lot going on there. So you could try to attack it like you did before, right? You could say A plus B plus C, but then we have double counting issues, right, in our intersections. So what if I subtract this intersection, this intersection, and this intersection? All right, well, I've. I've eliminated my double counting issue by doing that, but do you see another issue? What about this triple intersection in the middle? Well, now I've subtracted it three times. Okay, so if I subtract it three times, three events, that means I've, I haven't counted what's in the triple intersection at all. Okay, so for something like this, we got to say A plus B plus C minus the three intersections, but then add back the triple intersection. All right, so I think a Venn diagram really helps visualize that. What about extending that to multiple events? All right, that, that gets kind of messy, and it depends on whether we have an odd or even number of events, um, but it's doable. Maybe you can, uh, maybe you can kind of try to do that with four or five events or keep generalizing that. All right, let's use some similar ideas here to try to generalize our ideas for intersections. All right, we know what to do for two independent events, their intersection, can we extend that to three? Say A and B and C. Yes, if we want to find the intersection of A and B and C, just say A times B times C. All right, so we're seeing when things are mutually exclusive, when things are independent, it makes stuff pretty easy, right? Beyond three events, I can say A times B times C times D times however many I want, All right? What if they're dependent, though? What if I want to know A and B and C dependent events? Or A and B and C and D and, and related to multiple events? Well, you can do it, but you're going to have to update your conditionals as you go. All right, so again, doable, but gets kind of messy. You know, beyond just a handful of events, I probably wouldn't want to do that without a computer. Okay, so we've got a couple different rules, addition, multiplication, couple different types of relationships, independence, and mutually exclusive. We need to know how to apply rules over all of those and when we have multiple independent or mutually exclusive events. Okay, so thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next time.